Hello and welcome to Serving the Faithful webinar series, fourth in a series of webinars focusing on faith-based organizations in Pinellas County and disaster response. My name is Jess McCracken. I'm the whole community specialist here with Pinellas County Emergency Management. And these webinars are presented by the Juvenile Welfare Board of Pinellas County, our faith-based community partners and Pinellas County Emergency Management. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. I need to let you know that this program is being recorded. During the program, you will be muted and your video will remain off. If you need to, you can communicate with us by asking questions or using the chat feature. And the question, the Q&A feature can be found at the bottom of your screen. If you just click on that and go ahead and put your questions in there. Uh, we do have a time restriction. So if we don't get to your question, we will be sending out a follow-up email with all of the questions and the answers from tonight's program. So to jump right in, uh, we have with us tonight, Kevin Chenault, the Director of Social Services for Salvation Army in Clearwater. And he will provide congregations and nonprofit organizations with a clearer picture of where they fit into disaster response. We will learn about what an emergency operations center is, disaster assistance, and how you can connect with services that you need. Then we will hear from Brian Ellis, the Disaster Recovery Coordinator with Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, who will walk us through building a plan and share useful practices that organizations can implement through business continuity plans and steps to recovery. This webinar is a precursor to part two, where we will exercise our plans, and that is scheduled for June 30th. We'll be assigning everybody into small breakout rooms, and we will actually work through a scenario to identify considerations that could be built into your congregation's own plan. Kevin, take it away. Thank you, Jess. I appreciate the time to be able to share with everybody today. I'm going to share my screen real quick. I'm going to talk today a little bit about what a disaster is and how the congregations and organizations that you're involved in uh, can participate in the disaster, disaster response, and uh, can you hear me, Mary, Jess? Okay. It just says I'm muted. Uh, so, uh, but we'll, we're going to talk about disasters and how congregations in your organization can respond in time of a disaster. So let's talk a little bit about what a disaster is. There's some definitions that we're going to share. Uh, the first definition is this, a disaster is a sudden onset, an occasion that, uh, that seriously disrupts social routines, causes adoption of unplanned actions to adjust to the disruption are designed in social space and time and endanger uh, value social objects. So that's pretty clear and can be confusing. Uh, but American Red Cross came out with a, a slightly different dis, uh, dis definition of a disaster. A disaster is an occurrence such as a hurricane, tornado, storm, flood, high water, wind-driven water, tidal wave, earthquake, drought, blizzard, pestilence, famine, fire, explosion, volcano, eruption, building collapse, transportation accident, silver disorder, or other situation that causes or creates human suffering which the victim cannot alleviate without assistance. And for those of us who are in the disaster assistance field, that last part in red really does go in and, and shows why we're there in, in the disaster response. It's to help in that human suffering, to help them with that assistance. But maybe for some folks, uh, this is a little bit clearer definition. Um, and, and this really is the definition that uh, FEMA and the federal government uses. A disaster is a special action declared by the President of the United States which authorizes the federal government to deploy resources and activate programs to assist state and local governments, private citizens, utilities, and businesses cope with and recover from an incident which has overwhelmed the capacities of the state and local government. So for the U.S. government, the individual is really not involved in the definition of a disaster. So when you bring all of those definitions that we just talked about together, that's when you really start to get a picture of what a disaster can be or what a disaster is and how we may need to respond as a congregation. 
So let's think a little bit now about what a hazard may be. Does anybody know or think about what, what would be a hazard? So for us, a hazard is a condition that can potentially lead to an emergency or a disaster. So you in Pinellas County, US 19 could be a hazard. Um, because if a bridge collapses on US-19, that would be a major impact to the community. I mean, in, um, impact to traffic flow and a lot of different things occur. Um, major football games can be a hazard because it could lead to a disaster or in a state of an emergency. So in the disaster world, we need to be prepared for hazards and in a congregational life. Think about what a hazard may be in your congregation. Hazard may be the like, utilities going down just before you start a worship service or something that would interrupt your business of, pre of doing worship for your folks. And so let's move on a little bit. Let's talk a little bit and think about the emergency management cycle. What is emergency management and, and how do we look at that and how do we respond and how do we plan? So in the, uh, it's, it's really a cycle, a complete cycle where we start thinking about and looking at the phases of emergency management. You need to be prepared for, for hazards, be prepared for a disaster to respond. If something happens, then we move into the response phase where we as organizations or as the county or, or even as the church, how do you respond to what just happened? And then longer term, you move into recovery, which really begins to think about how do you recover? How do you get back to, to what the new normal is? And then you move into uh, the next cycle, which is mitigation and prevention. How do you prevent something from happening or prevent damage from happening. That's what mitigation is as we look through. So preparedness, how do you get prepared? You really, as a congregation, we need to be thinking about that. How do we help our, our members or, your, or the members of your organization be prepared individually? And how do you help your congregation and your building be prepared? So it encompasses all actions that are taken as individuals, as a community, as organizations in being prepared. We encourage all of our um, members in the community to have a disaster response kit. What's, what are you going to have in, in case something happens? Um, and during hurricane season, we need food. Uh, you, we encourage all individuals in our community to have at least a seven day supply of food in case something happens. They're able to respond and they're able to take care of themselves in that time and as they move forward that. So that's really what preparedness is. How do you prepare yourself for something to happen or prepare your congregation? And in response. Response are activities that include immediate actions to save lives, protect property, and meet essential human needs. So the response can be drastically different depending on what the disaster or the hazard that we're dealing with um, happens. And really it changes us to who we are also. Um, the county and first responders, their number one priority is to save lives. And how do, how do they save lives? And then um, protect property from being further damaged. And as, as responders in disaster work, some of us are out there helping to meet human needs. And really that's what a congregation can be doing or organizations. How do we help folks feed? How do we help folks recover? And how do we just help them respond to what just happened? So that's really what the response phase is. And then in recovery, recovery involves a lot of different things and it's a lot further off. Um, it's not the immediate response after a disaster. The recovery can be, how do you restore the public infrastructure, restore roads, reconstruction of private property, and how do you begin to resume regular operations of your business or your church or your nonprofit organization, if you're a nonprofit organization? So all of that's into recovery and, and really how do you start to get back to, to maybe a new normal, a new opportunity as we move forward. And then mitigation. 
Mitigation involves taking special actions designed to reduce or eliminate risks to persons, property, or to lessen the consequences of an in incident. Mitigation may be after a flood. Um, if your house has been damaged and you go to rebuild or, or to restore, maybe mitigation would be putting your house on stilts instead of building it at ground level. So if something happens again, the amount of damage that occurs would be lessened. And then prevention is, is all the steps that are taken to, uh, to avoid an emergency or to inter intervene or to stop an incident from ever occurring. Uh, prevention is really is becoming more and more important and more and more involved for folks as we start in looking at incidences that occur that are different than what it is at, than what are what we used to think as typical disasters hurricanes and things like that um, but prevention uh, how do you prevent uh, somebody from breaking into a building how do you pre prevent prevent things from hap bad things from happening that's what prevention is as we move forward so now we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to talk about emergency management who are the players? Who are the, what are the procedures that go, go on in a county and as we start talking about emergency management? Uh, emergency management, let's look at it in three different levels or three different areas. Let's start by looking at the local level. Um, but so emergency management is the, uh, pr the systematic approach of, for preparing for, responding to, and recovering from disasters. Um, it's, it really is an all-hazards approach to planning. It involves the local, state, and federal level, and then during disaster, emergency management coordinates the big picture, enables all emergency responders to respond in, uh, as agencies work together. So in emergency management, the local level, uh, we've been planning and preparing for, for incidences to occur for many, many years. And, and when something happens, we hope we're prepared and we get out there and work together at, at, a, at a local level and respond. And then the state level um, has, basically it's the same type of thing. And then the federal level, which is, includes um, FEMA, uh, helps us respond through the emergency management that way. So what is a disaster and what is our response? So when a disaster happens, our first responders, of course, are gonna be local folks. Um, they're the folks that are coming from your local community, fire departments, police officers, and things like that. If something, if, if, if the incident is, is large and they can't handle it themselves, they're gonna ask for assistance if they're overwhelmed. And uh, that's when they're either going to go to other communities to ask for help to come in, or they may go to the state and ask for assistance and if the disaster is really big, we might be re asking to bring in some federal assistance. So that's how all of the, 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 the organizations and emergency management works together. It all starts local though, in our local community. And, um, and, and nobody comes in unless the local folks ask for additional assistance. So, so if the county gets overwhelmed, they're going to reach out to the state and they're gonna ask for assistance from the state. And, and to bring in some additional resources. So that's kind of the way the process works for us on a local level. First responders, insurance is gonna be there, charities, Red Cross, Salvation Army, um, all of those local people are going to be there helping uh, in that small impact. There might be a limited number of victims. It might be a small tornado or twister in Pinellas Park that, that impacted that particular area. That local disaster, pretty much the local folks can handle that. Uh, but if it gets bigger, like a hurricane or something like that, and they get overwhelmed, uh, that's when we're going to ask for assistance from the state. Um, and so here in Pinellas County, um, our local emergency management coordinates the local response. It's managed by a local emergency manager. Uh, and then it, they usually, they can vary in size and complex. Uh, complexity depending on the jurisdiction. Some counties are larger, some counties are smaller, so it really it's it's customized for the county. But ultimately, it's the county manager or the city elected officials. They're the ones who are ultimately charged with providing for the safety of the citizens 
in their community. So that's kind of the way it just, it just flows through that way. So in emergency management, uh, a lot of you may have heard um, the phrase EOC. So the question is, well, what is an EOC? And uh, what, do we, what happens in an, OC, in, in an EOC? EOC actually stands for Emergency Operations Center. So it's typically an EOC is a protected facility where emergency response, response organizations or agencies gather together to coordinate that emergency response. Typically, everybody in the EOC is working there together and we can, they can talk to each other and, and really provide that response quickly and easily. They're usually laid out in, in areas, in, in ways that you can work together, you can talk to each other, uh, you can really do that interaction and, and inner workings that needs to be involved for a response to occur and for us to respond in times of need. So our EOC, is responsible for coordinating and supporting the efforts of on-site responders. We monitor and, and develop a situ uh, the developing situation. We collect and disseminate critical information to government agencies, uh, liaisons, the media, the general public, uh, nonprofit organizations. So all of that information is gathered in the EOC and then funneled back out to the areas so that everybody can work together and and really perform and, and, do, and give a unified response to a disaster as it occurs. So, state of emergencies, you hear about those, and, and uh, so what if the disaster is a larger disaster or a major impact area? You may need to declare a state of emergency. Local responders are overwhelmed. Uh, the state government can be contacted and the governor may declare a state of emergency. And a lot can, we're not gonna really get into today what a state of emergency involves, but it really opens up a lot of opportunities or a lot of resources for the local government. Uh, so if a state of emergency is declared by the governor, it really does make a difference and it helps out. And so if uh, that's if the local people are, are overwhelmed, if the state is overwhelmed, a request then can we move on beyond this to the federal government. Any request for assistance from the federal government must be made by the governor of the state that's requesting the assistance. The government, the federal government cannot come in without the request of the state. So it's state emergency management, and for us it's in Tallahassee. Each state has an emergency management agency that coordinates the state resources during the time of a disaster or other emergency. The state uh, has an emergency operations plan. They, they figure out how and they help us respond. Operations are managed from a state emergency operations center. And like I said just a little while ago, the governor may declare a state of emergency, which would then allow deploying of state resources to assist. With the COVID-19 re response, there was a state of emergency re uh, declared by the governor. And uh, so gov uh, state resources were able to flow into our community to help re help us out. Uh, we received multiple items and, and from all the way from face masks down to food uh, that really did help in, that, in the response for COVID-19. And then talking about a federally declared disaster. And that's really if it's a large catastrophic event. Um, a, a disaster can be declared uh, by the federal government. Um, so that pretty much like all others, it's local response. If the local responders are overwhelmed, uh, the, the state may declare a state of emergency. Like I said, the federal government cannot come in and re re assist without the governor's request. So. Governor, governor will put together um, a, a package of information to be sent to the president, and then the president could declare a disaster declaration, which then would bring in federal resources to our community from the Department of ha Homeland Security, Federal Emergency Management Agency. All of those th resources can start flowing in at that point. 
And in all levels of this, charitable organizations and non-government organizations are involved in the response. We're there helping out. And, and that's for us. Uh, there's a state VOAD, which is volunteer organizations aligned, aligned in disaster. Uh, really, they're there helping. Uh, all of these, all of those organizations are working in together, uh, supporting and helping out in that. So generally, a presidential disaster declara declaration is required for activation of the federal emergency management. Uh, we've heard, you've heard about FEMA. They're the lead agency that's brought, that comes in and assists. Uh, or provides resources, all of those resources flow through that way. A broader range of programs, and we're not really gonna get into that right now. Uh, but non-government organizations are key to the response in times of disaster. Organizations like the American Red Cross, businesses like Walmart, Publix, you know, businesses and organizations like that provide a lot of support in times of response. The Salvation Army, Anheuser-Busch provides water quite often in times of disaster. All of those non-government organizations play a key role in response in times of disaster. So how do you as a congregation prepare? How do you as a congregation be prepared to respond and keep your, and, and, and to help in a time of disaster? Let's talk about that a little bit. The first emergency manager, I, I know I said this a couple of weeks ago in one of our webinars, uh, Noah, what made Noah a good emergency manager? He obeyed the severe weather warnings. He prepared his family by stocking emergency supplies, such as food. He planned emergency shelter for his family, the ark. And he executed the plan to help others as he moved forward. So that's really what an emergency manager does. And that's what we are called to do as bodies of the faith. We're, we're called to prepare our congregation, our family, to respond and to be uh, move through a disaster. The three steps in a preparedness plan, prepare our people, prepare your members of your organization to respond, prepare them to, be, um, to, to weather out a disaster. Protect your property. You cannot come back to a house of worship if it's not there. So you want to make sure your house of worships are prepared. They're protected. And then plan how you may want to help others after, the, after you've taken care of your people and your property. And so people always come first. Your congregation, your members of your organization are your most valuable resource. They're the most valuable asset as we move forward. I'm gonna move through the next couple slides fairly quickly, uh, but really, how do you prepare? You're gonna identify warning systems for your home, church, things like that. How are you gonna communicate? We talked, did a communication webinar a couple weeks ago about communicating. Develop that plan. Develop how you're gonna communicate with each other and exercise that. Figure out how an evacuation plan. If you're going, if you or your members need to evacuate, be prepared for that. Know how you do, how to evacuate. Know what the evacuation routes are, and build up a backup plan because some of those evacuation routes may not be the same. Develop a family communications plan. Identify somebody outside of your disaster area who your family communicate with, and and they may be the person who. Um, will you, all the messages will go to them and they can let everybody else know that you're safe because cell phones can go down. Uh, we, we've seen that cell phones can, the network can get overloaded. Um, but if the networks, if your cell phone's not working, try text messaging, try sending emails. Sometimes those networks will work even if the cell phones do not work. Build yourself or have your, or encourage your members of your organization to build a family disaster preparedness kit. Include in it, like I said, seven days of food, flashlights, water, and things like that. Times of disaster, bottled water can be hard to find. Tap water is drinkable. Put some tap water aside ahead of time and prepare yourself and your family for that. Secure important documents, financial records, home inventory, things like that. Make sure you know where everything is in case something happens. And then plan for special needs people. This is where you as a congregation or you as a nonprofit organization can help the community 
really and help them prepare. If you've got folks who cannot take care of themselves, make sure that those folks are have a plan. Make sure those folks are registered with the special needs shelter with the Pinellas County and just encourage them and help them through that. Make sure you have medications and above all, take care of your pets. Make sure you have a plan for your, for your pets. You do not want to leave your pets behind if you're going to evacuate. Figure out and, and figure out a plan to take care of them and protect them also. Protect your church, protect your property. Mitigate potential hazards. Figure out, okay, what are you going to have to cover? You, you're going to have to cover large windows or, or whatever. Just develop a, fan, a facility emergency plan to protect your property. Your facility plan should provide answers to these questions. What do I do if someone is hurt or you feel threatened? What do you do if the emergency is not immediately life-threatening? Do you call emergency services or whatever? How do you get help out? How do you get out of the building if you need to evacuate? If you have to hide within the building, how do you shelter in place? And how do you warn others if dangerous individual is in the building? All of this, you really need to be thinking about your facility plan and how that happens. So our facility plan should not only include physical dangers like tornadoes or hurricanes. They need to involve and include other things like um, th uh, threats coming into the building like active shooters and things like that. How do you warn your congregation members or, of, of somebody that's in the building that shouldn't be? And how do you protect them from that? All of that should be involved in your facility plan. Next and last is how do you plan to help others? Decide what you're going to do and get ready to do it. So what do you do as a congregation to help respond? How do you help congregations respond? A lot of congregations like to do donation drives. We don't encourage that in the Salvation Army because the, in the times of disaster, you don't need lots of items coming in that aren't needed. So if you're gonna do a, a donations drive, make sure you've identified and communicate with the organization that's going to receive the donated items. Make sure they know they're coming. Figure out what the items are Figure out uh, that are needed. Figure out the quantity and things like that. Make sure you've got transportation to get the items to that area, especially if the disaster occurred out of state or in a different area. Make sure you've arranged transportation to get it there. And identify the location it's going to go, what, where it's going to be unloaded. Make sure you've boxed things, palletized, labeled the items, and protected the items, and ship only what they need. Don't ship them used clothing. Don't ship them things they're not going to need. That happens all the time. But if you're going to do a donations drive as a nonprofit or a uh, faith-based organization, make sure you do it in a way and, and, and do it so that folks are, can use the items that are being received. Sheltering. There's some liability issues with sheltering. Uh, you need to make sure you have your staff trained if you're going to open a shelter. Um, consider uh, the duration of sheltering. Are you going to feed folks? There's a lot that goes into sheltering. We're not going to really talk about sheltering. We've talked a little bit about it. We'll talk about it a little more in the future. There's food service. There's supplies. There's a lot that goes into running a shelter. Um, but if you're going to open a shelter, please make sure that, that somebody at the county level at least knows the folks are there so that they're aware of it. And then are you going to develop volunteer teams? This is a, an excellent way that a lot of congregations or faith-based organizations can help out. They develop uh, work, um, get some volunteer teams that are going to go respond. That might be something you want to do. Think about how your, your congregation members can respond in the time of disaster. So finally, a couple roles for the faith-based organizations. You want to educate your members and the community members about the dangers that, um, of a likely disaster, things like that. Look after the members of your organization, particularly those with special needs. Work in partnership with governmental and other relief organizations. Determine what, if any, unmet needs of people who are especially vulnerable in, uh, in the disaster area. Advocate for those who are in most need. 
restore and rebuild community relationships, provide pastoral or spiritual care, support disaster relief operations in neighboring towns and across the nation, provide a larger vision of the life that includes emotional and spiritual care as well as physical and material buildings. You may wanna host a blood drive, participate in disaster drills with the county or other organizations, host a first aid or CPR class for your church members, and partner with local fire departments to host fire safety classes. Or you may wanna sponsor Salvation Army Canteen Crew, things like that. These are all items that you as a faith-based organization may do. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian, who's gonna share some other information with, with you guys. Well, <laughs> Kevin, that was uh, really, really good information. I always enjoy seeing that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Share. All right, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm Brian Ellis. I'm the Disaster Recovery Coordinator for the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. So just want to talk about a few things. Um, this, I want this presentation to be stimulating. As you, um, as you begin to develop plans or have already developed a plan for your congregation, for your entity, uh, I want some of the things you see to, to stimulate you and cause you to think additional. Um, what can we do ahead of time to prepare for the unknown or the unexpected? So definitely want to spur some, some thoughts here. Um, in 2004, 2005, uh, Tampa Bay uh, had a very active hurricane season. So we saw a lot of big name storms. 2005, we saw Katrina, and that hit uh, our neighbor to, you know, in, um, to the north here. Fast forward to 2017, we had Hurricane Irma, so that was a big event. So what's important to take away from that is we went 12 or so years without a major storm event. So it's easy to become complacent in between storms or disasters. Uh, so that's just some food for thought. Hurricane Irma woke us up, and now look, it's been three years since. So just some th things to consider. During my presentation, you're gonna, you might hear me say business a little bit. Um, I, I work with a lot of businesses and try to help them develop a plan and sit down. Um, but the concepts apply to faith-based organizations, congregations, nonprofits, and even in a lot of cases, your own personal home. So if you hear me say business, just that applies to you and your, your organization. So uh, to start off, I'd like to talk about some FEMA statistics. So this one is kind of eye-opening to me. Out of all businesses that closed, or rather all organizations that closed because they were impacted by a disaster and they failed completely, they weren't able to reopen their doors, 40% of those entities, organizations, uh, did not have a plan in place and that was the actual cause of why they failed. So they were impacted, no plan in place, and there was just nothing they could do. So that's a FEMA statistic. Additionally, one in four entities can expect to experience a disruption sometime during their operation. So real people, real organizations, um, we're, we're all going to be in, in a situation at some point. So just keep in mind the, thing, the time to start thinking about preparation and doing your due diligence, creating a plan or updating your plan is when the sun is shining, times like this is going to be best. So the steps that I focus on are very similar to the steps that Kevin covered, uh, in fact. So for me, preparation, um, as far as the disaster recovery process goes, preparation is gonna be most important. So that's step number one. Uh, response, what do you do when disaster strikes and then recovery? Now it's time to pick up the pieces, now it happens. Um, preparation is gonna be most important. So another FEMA statistic when it comes to recovering is that for every dollar that you invest in preparation, it is estimated by FEMA that $6 can be saved when it's time to recover. So preparation is certainly the most important. It, it takes the most effort. It's you know, easier said than done, but definitely going to be heavy on the preparation as it relates to you and your business and, and your congregation uh, continuity plan that you should be thinking about. So preparation, let's dive into it. Is your congregation, your organization, is your church prepared? Quote that I like to start off with, just for stimulation purposes. Uh, this is by Benjamin Franklin. By failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. So basically, um, 
by not making that investment up front, you might be doing yourself some disservices. If you can, it's, it's always a good idea to do as much as you can on the front um, side of things to reap the benefits later. And it's kind of a silly example, but think about painting. If anyone's ever painted a wall, um, you, you know that 90% of the work that you do is in the preparation of getting the wall prepped and taped off and getting it all pretty. And then the easy part is painting. And if you don't do the preparation right or well, then um, your job might not look so fantastic when you're done. So just some food for thought. So as it relates to your organization, your church, um, what's most important in my eyes, and I think uh, Kevin may agree that communication is going to be most important. For your day-to-day -day operations, communication is mission critical. It will be likely the most com important uh, component of your entire operation. The same is true when faced with a disaster. So from day-to-day, -day, communication is most critical. Now when you're faced with a disaster, it's, it's still number one. So think about your business, um, think about your, your entity, think about your, your membership and your, your organizations objectively, and think of a few things. So here are some open-ended questions I want you to think about as you begin to develop or, or renew, refresh your, your plan. So within your organization, and think about your, your membership, your, if you do have staff, think about them, everyone involved in the picture, is a text message or is an email sufficient enough to communicate with everybody necessary in the operation? Can you get the message across to everybody? So here's a question, raise your hand, I know you can't, but uh, did anyone here during Hurricane Irma lose the ability to communicate? Just me. For the first time in my life, I, on my personal cell phone, I could not make phone calls for three days. I have T-Mobile service, just like a lot of people, but I was able to make text messages which that totally caught me off guard and uh, <laughs> never dealt with that before. I see a hand raised. I'm excited about that. Let's see. Not quite sure what to do here. Uh, Jess, can you help me out with my hand raised? Well, we'll circle back to that. Anyway, um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm still learning here. So as far as communication goes, having one method of after hours communication to get in touch with everyone that's critical in your operation um, is always a good idea. So how do you communicate with, with perhaps your pastor or um, members of your, your organization or anyone who's critical, even delivery drivers that may work with your entity, how can you get in touch with them at two in the morning? It's easier said than done, and is a is a phone call the way to go, or a text message, or how, how are you going to do it? So think about your specific operation and try to think what will work well and what won't in advance, and, and put that down in writing if you can. Um, <clears throat> has anyone here had to ever dealt with um, trying to communicate with someone? Perhaps English wasn't their first language, or maybe they have disabilities, and communication is just not as standard as we're used to. Uh, more than likely. We have been there and done that. So how do we get our message and information out to them as well? So it's going to be quite specific to our organization in our own um, specific world. So just once again, think about how would that work? What's that going to look like for you? As best you can. So this is something I think is highly critical. Establish safe points for immediate contact. Um, Kevin mentioned a little bit about dissemination and vetting in the beginning, which is, is the same here. So having one voice of information that represents your entity and that person is going to speak for your organization. They're going to receive information. They're going to vet that information, make sure that it's accurate and then just as quickly as they can get it out to the uh, constituents of your organization. So um, getting your members good information and fast and into their hands is going to be very critical. One of the worst things, well, the two worst things you can do is start putting out information that is inaccurate about your organization. Imagine if that information gets to your, your membership, your congregation, that's just not going to be helpful. But at the same time, having no information go out, just a big black hole in the world, is not going to do, um, do you any good. So you want to make sure that information is accurate and flowing. So one, place, uh, one point of, of contact. So has anyone here watching ever watched a major news story somewhere in the country unfold? And you tune into a news station and all of a sudden uh, 
one news station covers it one way, this big developing story, and you, you flip to another channel and another news station, they cover it differently. And by the time you're done watching this coverage of this, the situation, you're not really sure what's taking place. So that's what you want to avoid, especially in times of disaster. So sit down and, and try to determine who would that person be that would fit that role and who would their backup be and how would it work. Um, over here is a picture uh, to the right of the actual, this is one of the forecasted tracks of Hurricane Irma at, at any given time. So disasters are not limited to um, just hurricanes. Kevin uh, talked about that. All kinds of things, fire, lightning, political unrest. We're seeing that um, employee theft, for instance. So with some disasters, we get seven to 10 days of advance notice, which is helpful, but that's not always the case. But sometimes these things are, are weeks and weeks and months and months in the making. So another um, tip I'd like to discuss here is as best you can monitor the news, forecast on the horizon and look to see if there's anything out in the world that may affect you at a later date. So uh, about six years ago, there was a shortage of limes in Central and South America. So the quality of limes decreased, the quantity of limes decreased, and the price of limes increased. So locally in the Tampa Bay area, businesses months later, or weeks later rather, um, were faced with a shortage of, of something that's kind of critical to their operation. I was working for one of those businesses at the time and they did not expect that, I assure you. So they were forced to kind of deal with that on the fly. But that didn't happen overnight. That happened weeks in the making and months in the making. So the point to that is if there's something that's critical to your operation, do your due diligence. It doesn't hurt to kind of look out on the horizon in the world, turn on the news and see if everything is, is, is totally um, going smoothly or if there might be something uh, that you need to know. It doesn't hurt to pick up the phone and call um, whoever. You, you never know. So it's just something that you should think about as you develop your plan. When faced with a disaster, so your, your congregation, your organization, your nonpro nonprofit, what do they do if they're dealing with a disaster and you're here with me listening to me speak? How is your, your operation going to um, react? Will they know what to do? So while you're making your plans, um, think about some, some things here that are, that are fairly obvious and also take a look at this picture of the vehicles traveling on the interstate. This is one of the evacuation pictures during Hurricane Irma, so I'm sure some of you remember that. Um, so have an evacuation plan. Think about your entity during its full operation or after hours. Um, if disaster were to strike your, your building or your operation, what steps would your, your constituents immediately take? How would that look like? So start thinking about those things, about your, your entity objectively and, and write them down and float some ideas. Everybody's different. Create redundant alert measures. So this goes back to communication, um, getting information and, and checking on everyone that needs uh, to be accounted for. Is that text message sufficient? Is that phone call sufficient? So once again, uh, figure out how to reach people and ha have multiple ways if, if you can. That's in a perfect world. And establish safe points for immediate operations. So if your brick and mortar uh, con congregation, um, if something happens to your building or, or operations need to suspend there, where can you go to resume operations uh, effectively and, and quickly? Are you able to hold your, your sessions in your parking lot or an alternative location? Or are you able to hold services online? Um, think about what your group can do well in advance and how it would work and what it would look like. So these are things we really don't think about until it's too late. I mean, look at the, the COVID-19 situation and all of a sudden the whole world went to Zoom overnight. You know, we weren't really anticipating that, but, but we, we uh, carried through. So the picture here, this is a home. This is a private home. And this is a story I like to tell um, to kind of reinforce the point. There's a, a, um, an accounting firm called Accounting by Moore, located in Valrico in Hillsborough County. Um, it's a three-person operation, and before Hurricane Irma, this small entity um, of three employees, they secured their, their brick-and-mortar location. They had a physical location, so they secured it uh, in the event that Hurricane Irma would cause damage. They, for the first time, took all of their client information and shared it on all three computers, 
so that all they would need to resume operations would be uh, electricity and internet, and they could begin working again um, from a different location. So Hurricane Irma came and went. Uh, their brick and mortar was was good. It fared very well. And because of the precautions these this uh, organization took, the three um, employees were able to resume operations quickly and they didn't miss a beat. So this entity did a very good job of identifying um, safe points for immediate operations and they were able to resume quickly. So why am I telling you a boring story about some accountants in Hillsborough County? Um, two of three of the employees lived on the Alafia River and Hurricane Irma came and went and their homes were fine. Everything was great. The next day, the flood waters or the, uh, the levels, the water levels of the Alafia River rose dramatically. I think it was 16 feet. So the next day, two out of three employees' homes catastrophically flooded. So when I interviewed the owner to this organization uh, about seven months after Hurricane Irma, she was at the time um, living in a fifth wheel trailer on her own property because her house was condemned by the county. So these are real organizations and real people just like the people listening to this right now. So I just want to kind of uh, wake you up a little bit. So I gave this presentation um, five, six months after Hurricane Irma. I gave this presentation to the Greater Hernando Chamber of Commerce and they operate just outside of Brooksville. So I arrived a day early to Brooksville and uh, I wanted to do a little tour of the downtown. So I walked through downtown Brooksville. I walked through this intersection, kept on going down the street uh, till I found the high school, saw a few more things, decided to turn around. And 20 minutes after I had gone through this intersection, this is what I discovered. So another question to the audience, um, does, did anyone, does anyone think that this light pole knew that this is going to happen? And the answer is probably not. So disasters can happen any time in any place. Here's an example. What if this car had gone through your faith-based faith organization? How would your, your operation react? What would the plan be? What would your constituents do? What's the plan? What's the goal? So uh, just more food, food for thought as you develop your plan and start thinking about the specific scenarios that will apply to you. Building resilience in your supply chain. I understand that this is a business concept, so work with me here, but some of the concepts do carry over. So as far as your organization goes, your congregation, your church, whatever it is, um, concentrate on your key products and services. So if your services, your key services are, are holding sessions with your, your um, membership and holding church services, uh, key products might be maybe you your organization um, creates meals and delivers meals to the community frequently or whatever it is, whatever your operation, your, your organization does, uh, concentrate on those key things that you deliver and how can you continue to keep that performance up during disaster time. So that's kind of the mission at hand. Easier said than done. I understand that. If you're a um, supplier of, of something that is pertinent to your operation. So if, if you're a church and you deliver, um, 300 meals a week because that's what you guys want to do when you're helping the community um, and your supplier of, of such items is on their own accord one flat tire away from going out of operation, which is their fault, nothing to do with you. At the very least, since it's important to your organization, identify a plan B, a secondary supplier, and that can apply to whatever that it is that is taking place in your operation. And with your congregations and your organizations, as best you can on, on good days like today, uh, identify any single point of failure. So look at your brick and mortar locations or whatever assets you have and try to determine what is on its last legs right now. What have we been neglecting for so long? You know, has that roof been leaking for two years and we just haven't got around to it? So what are the weak links? Put your, your stealth, yourself in a state of you know, slightly controlled paranoia and, and try to identify what you can fix today that will really um, save you when it's time to, to deal with some further challenges based on uh, disasters that are imminent. So this is additional food for thought. And now here's another concept, and this does relate to faith-based organizations. I call this the Budding Up Alliance. Um, this is in, in a restaurant located in, in Seminole, the Angry Pepper Restaurant 
and they have a relationship with the Angry Pepper Waterside Restaurant, or yeah, in Madeira Beach. The two entities are independently owned and independently operated, but they have a relationship, or at least they had at one point, um, where they can do a few things in times of disaster or increased demand or whatever it is. So these two organizations, if they choose, um, they can lend staff, lend help uh, to each restaurant. So if one restaurant is dealing with increased demand or needs some assistance, the other location can lend some assistance and vice versa. So that's a lot of help and a lot of peace of mind knowing you have that option available to you. Each um, organization can exchange reliable information. So if one entity is dealing with a situation, someone slips and falls, or, or uh, they're trying to figure out how to best social distance with, with inside the organization, there's a good chance that other uh, restaurant has already dealt with the situation and can share information to help each other out. So that can go a long ways when dealing with a disaster. Um, and then share inventory if there's any type of increased demand. So if one group runs out of, um, of an item, the other restaurant can uh, fill the void and pay them back at a later date. So there's a lot of advantages here. So why would you want to work with your competitor? Maybe you don't, but in situations like this, it's good to have options on the table. So these concepts directly carry over to if, you're, if it's your home and you want to help a neighbor and have them help you, you're putting up some window, uh, some shutters or something like that in, during preparation, um, helping each other out with, with inventory and all kinds of things. Same with faith-based organizations. So if you're a standalone uh, congregation and located wherever you are and you want to perhaps work with another entity in times of disaster, um, it can go a long way. So if, if something, if your building is compromised, perhaps you can form a relationship with your neighbor and congregation and say, if things get tough, do you mind if we hold services at your location for a short amount of time or whatever it is? Um, it's just good to have those options available. So think about these things. Joe's Island Clams. This is an uh, entity that I worked, that I interviewed um, about six or seven months after Hurricane Irma, and they have a good story. So it'll all tie into the preparation phase and, and these concepts do carry to, they do apply to pretty much everybody. Uh, the owner here, DJ Strott, he takes his boat and his trailer to his underwater parcel. He seeds his underwater parcel with baby clams called clam stock. He has three main suppliers of clam stock and he advises if any three of those uh, suppliers were to fail, it's likely his business would fail. Uh, it's fragile is the way he describes his, his operation, but it's lucrative and that's why he does it. He harvests those clams when they reach adulthood, takes them to his uh, clam manufacturing plant, cleans, processes, harvests, and then ultimately delivers those clams to uh, local restaurants and grocery stores. Hurricane Irma was imminent, so the owner here secured his, his tangible assets as we all did and all should. Um, Hurricane Irma dropped a small branch on his on his operation and he was able to go the route of insurance and pick up the pieces um, in a timely fashion. And we'll talk about that more uh, in a moment. With Hurricane Irma, it brought a lot of, a lot of destruction to a lot of things. Um, there was a lot of fresh water flooding with Hurricane Irma. Fresh, fresh water flooding is rain. Rain kills clams, fresh water kills clams. So 30% of, of this person's inventory were uh, destroyed due to Hurricane Irma. So in the months, seven months after uh, Hurricane Ir Irma, when I interviewed this uh, owner, he was out of inventory and normally he generates three to $7,000 worth of um, sales weekly. And that was not the case anymore. So in hindsight, one, um, one thing he wanted to explore is having a contingency stock overstocking his clam beds in the event that some inevitably die due to a disaster. So this ties into preparation. These are things that we don't think about until it's too late and they apply to, to all walks of life, congregations and in all kinds of uh, groups. So just think about your business, your organization. So response. So now we're faced with a, with a disaster what can our organizations do and our congregations do to resume uh, operations safely and effectively and, and get back to normalcy? So this is a picture I took. Uh, this is one day after Hurricane Irma. And I, I took this picture, I thought it was really cool. Um, after the fact, it, it spurred a few things. So this was one or two 
uh, restaurants that I saw that was open the day after Hurricane Irma. And you can see there's, it's a double drive through There's probably about 40, 50 cars wrapped around the building. And this is in St. Pete. So a couple uh, thoughts I had came to mind after the fact. Um, one, this organization did a really good job about uh, getting their doors open and resuming operations. So this is, I'm, I'm proud of this group. Um, does anyone here think that this entity was, was selling 100% of their menu that day? Probably not. Um, have anyone here had to ever wrangle your constituents or your members and try to get them um, up and, and responding quickly? So probably some of us have, and, and you can tell that's challenging. So this organization did a really good job about picking up the pieces and moving on. Uh, on a side, well, we'll get there. So responding to crisis. So see, these are some of the obvious things that will apply to your congregations and your organizations, especially if you have brick and mortar operations, which probably a lot of you do. So some of these things you've heard before, when in the aftermath of a disaster, get boots on the ground, get to your location if it's safe and you can, and evaluate your, your physical assets and, and the status of your organization, your building. Um, look to see if it's safe to, to resume, just get the overall understanding of, of what, um, what you're facing right now. Account for all of your constituents. So this is a good time to begin communication with your membership. Your, um, if, if you do have staff among your organization, you're gonna wanna engage them, uh, the community, and anyone that basically um, has a part in your organization. Get the information flowing. Figure out where people are and what their status is. Think about what are your next steps objectively about getting your business open, or not your business, I'm sorry, your, your organization. What is it gonna take? Um, you're gonna, you know, a couple of days and you're all, all good to go, or is this gonna be a long process? And once again, get the communication flowing, uh, have that one out, that one um, pre-selected voice to begin being the, 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 the person that gets information into the world and, and gets things uh, moving. In recovery, so this part, um, you, pre you prepare for your disaster, you responded, and now some entities are gonna be uh, faced with more challenges than others. So in a moment here, we'll talk about insurance, everyone's favorite thing to talk about. So uh, some of these items you have heard before as it relates to your congregations or, or brick and mortar locations, but they're important to talk about. Um, hurricane season is June 1st, so we are in the middle of it. So let's refresh a little bit here. So when dealing with an insurance claim for your operation, you're going to want to contact your insurance company immediately. Now is a good time, or when you're creating your, your continuity plan, now is a really wonderful time to identify who your contact is. If, if anyone doesn't know who they deal with directly or have that person's phone number saved in their phone, now is the optimal time to do so. Um, make sure in advance that, that your insurance company has all the proper names and spelling and addresses and all that red tape that you have to deal with. You want to make sure that's accurate and, and done well in advance before you have to go down this road. Take before and after pictures of your items. So before things are damaged, it's always a good idea, perhaps seasonally, to, to take an inventory of, of your assets. And then, of course, when dealing with an insurance claim, that's, that's the next part. If you have been impacted by a disaster, hurricane, flooding inside of your congregation or, or whatever it is you, you have, don't remove any damaged property until an adjuster has seen it. You don't wanna start throwing things away and then not be able to uh, recoup those losses because you know, that's why you have insurance. Only make repairs that are necessary to prevent further damage. So if your, your, your entity is impacted and you need to do some quick and prompt to um, up, um, repairs to the roof, well, if, if you need to prevent further damage, then that might be okay, but be very careful because during this particular time, you're gonna wanna play by the insurance company's rules as best you can for you to have the most success. So this is a scary process, but these are things that we should think about in advance, think about today while you're forming a plan. Um, just a, a quick question here. If you're impacted by a disaster or hurricane or whatever it is, and your uh, sewer systems begin to flood within your congregation or your entity. Is that damage, that flood damage inside of your, your, your building, is that covered by your standard insurance or is that a special flood insurance policy? 
So you're going to need to, I don't know, you're going to need to look at your organization very, very uh, specifically here. So these are some questions to ask yourself well in advance. More about insurance. So when an adjuster comes out to deal with your, your claim, if you have to go this route for your organization, accompany the adjuster, basically hold their hand, not literally, but go with the adjuster and make sure that all the damage that has occurred is seen by your adjuster. Make sure that the two of you are on the same page. They see everything that is not damaged and everything that is damaged because ultimately their report is really going to um, have an effect on, on how well your business or your operation recovers. Here is a, um, here's a tip, and I think this is highly important, and you've seen it a million times. You've seen it on billboards and bumper stickers. Hire licensed, reputable contractors. You're thinking, why am I telling you that? I already know that. When it comes to this tip, I think it is so, so critical um, to look for red flags. That's what I want this, this body to take away. So if you're dealing with um, contractors, especially after a disaster situation, there are five red flags. I can usually remember four, but here they are. So just try to remember them and take them home forever. But if you're dealing with a, a, a contractor that has a poor reputation, no reputation, a history of chasing payments, asking for 100% payment up front, or are the lowest bidder, these are all red flags. If you run into these, it is possible it's too good to be true. So be very, very careful um, when, when dealing with contractors after disaster. Just, just remember some red flags, and if you, if you see them, you know, be willing to, to move on. If you get an insurance denial, make sure you get it in writing. If that denial seems unfair, contact the Florida, Insur uh, Florida Office of Insurance Regulation. This is a body set up by the state. They will review your claim. If they determine that it is valid, they will fight for you and make sure that, that you are in much better shape. So that's just a, a good option to know about. The state watches over their, their residents. Um, another thing that I think is very important, this is a question for the audience here, but if your congregation or your, your entity is faced with a disaster and the damage of that disaster is a certain dollar threshold. You incurred so much damage in a dollar amount. And that damage is a, comes in below your deductible. Is it worth filing a claim at all? And I have learned in many situations it is. Make sure that you review your insurance policy be, before you, you take this 100% um, you know, to the bank. But depending on your policy, these insurance policies can be for a 12 month term. So if you're impacted by a uh, disaster and you incur some damage and that damage is below your threshold, in next month, your, your congregation or your building is impacted by a new disaster. And that old damage plus that new damage is greater than your deductible. You're going to want to wish you had that first claim on the books. So that's just something to think about. That's, those are things that we don't necessarily think about uh, until it's too late. So I, I know it sounds silly, but these are things that need to be considered well in advance. And once again, that's according to your policy. In recovering from crisis, so your organization, your entity, uh, just has been, just dealt with a disaster. Now what? Time to recover, time to pick up pieces and move on. When you're creating your plan or updating your plan for your business, these are things to con consider. Think back to Hurricane Irma and how you, your organization performed then. Identify your lessons learned. Identify what went smoothly and what didn't go smoothly. What can be improved upon the next time around? So don't forget the mistakes that, that happened to you in the past. How were our communications? Um, were we able to reach everyone when we needed to? All of our membership or did we leave out some people and uh, have them you know, worried? How did our communications perform? Do they need updates or, or further considerations? Were we satisfied with the way our technology performed? So did we run out for our, our group? You know, you had the, the very uh, forward thinking, maybe a couple members that went out and got some generators and brought them over. And then we realized that we couldn't get any gas for our generators. Or maybe we haven't started them up in 10 years and uh, they're just not, not ready to go. 
So our changes needed in our insurance policy. Do we need a separate policy for flood? Um, things like that. Did we get burned or, or their improvements? Did our staff fully understand, or uh, did our membership fully understand their roles as it relates to disaster? Were uh, there delays in reopening? If so, why? So here's a picture to the right of the actual forecasted track of Hurricane Irma at one point. It did move. Has anyone listening ever been at an outdoor tiki bar or restaurant when an afternoon thunderstorm is rolling in and all of a sudden everyone at the bar instantly becomes a weather person and they all say the same thing. Oh, the, the storm is just going to, it's going to blow right over. It's going to go around. It's not going to rain here. And more times than not, it does rain. So trying to forecast disasters is tricky business. It's not that easy. So if your neighbor swears they know where the next hurricane is going to go, don't believe them. So the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining on days like today. So the time to start thinking about your plan is right now uh, before you have to deal with a disaster. And if I have uh, 30 more seconds here, this is a wonderful resource put on by the state, floridadisaster.biz, specifically their disaster planning tool. This is a really cool website where you can actually look at your organization objectively. You can click on the little bubbles here and answer some questions about your organization. Um, whether that's your church or your nonprofit, doesn't matter. You can answer a couple questions and it's specific to your, your organization. When you're all done, it's so cool. It generates a uh, disaster or it, it generates a, a free business disaster plan. Hopefully everyone can see that where it's specific to your, your buildings um, or your, your organization's um, specific to your organization and there has there's lots of information that can help uh, get your plan started from scratch so that's a really cool piece of information I think it's wonderful and that's it thank you for having me today okay thank you so much Brian this is Mary Burrell uh, really fast just want to let you know that in two weeks we're going to take this stuff that we've been talking about tonight and put it to use we're going to have an exercise it'll actually be great fun it'll be great practice uh, we're going to have a scenario part of the scenario might just involve a, a hurricane named alex we're going to do breakout rooms uh, we're going to go through these plans and and have some fun and maybe learn some stuff too five o'clock we're going to give ourselves an hour and a half in case we go over so uh hope you can join us there's the meeting uh, link there. Jess will send it out to you. It's not a webinar. You don't have to register. And uh, thank you so much. And we'll see you in two weeks.